professor vili he what okay thank you can i first ask for clarification would you like me to speak for 15 or 15 minutes 15 minutes, 15 yes. minutes. Yes. okay all right uh, well thank you very much mr and mr chairman and thank you very much honorable members of the panel and indeed the audience uh, for attending here today it's a great privilege to be here to visit this beautiful university and to be a part of this very exciting conversation um, now my talk connects to um, uh, an issue that professor gunaratne uh, brought up in her conversation this pressing question of well, what do lawyers do to contribute to the legal community and to society at large and uh, it, my talk Uh, seeks to address that question and focuses particularly on the, the part of, of, of law that I am proud to be part of, and that is uh, environmental law. Not only environmental law, but uh, environmental legal scholarship. So um, I have th tried to think about how does environmental legal scholarship, what contributions do we make to the broader field of legal scholarship generally, Um, and also to, to the profession generally. Um, and there were five key points that I would like to share with you, specific contributions, I think, from environmental legal scholarship that advance the field and that make a positive and constructive discursive contribution to our legal community. Um, a first point is that environmental principles and ideas uh, challenge long entrenched general legal principles and conventions. Uh, I think it's indeed the case that if you look at uh, a lot of the exciting debates that are going on today about what role and what rationality law have in contemporary society, a lot of these debates are inspired by developments that happen in the field of environmental law. Uh, developments that Uh, for example, call into question long-held legal dogmas ar uh, around which we have organized our legal system. Uh, one of the core ideas that inspires pretty much any legal system that I am aware of is the notion of innocent until proven guilty, the notion that if you uh, make a claim, uh, you should uh, prove your claim, you should justify your claim. Now, in environmental law, we have seen in the past 25 years the emergence and uh, growing popularity of the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle, which posits that uh, if there are indications of um, risks of uh, serious and irreversible harm, uh, it may be warranted for, for example, for regulatory authorities or for judicial bodies to act in the absence of conclusive evidence. This is something that strongly challenges this uh, uh, notion that we held as self-evident in law that you always have to prove your claims. Uh, and so it's led to a lot of thought-provoking debate. Um, also, new developments have identified areas where conventional domestic or international understandings of law are maybe no longer fit for purpose. In other words, environmental problems can sometimes cause little crises, but productive crises in law. Um, for example, in the context of there being such, of uh, environmental uh, challenges, uh, typically assuming a transboundary or even a global, uh, a glo a global nature, uh, one might question whether traditional understandings of sovereignty and of territoriality and extraterritoriality are really still well equipped to deal with these kind of massive transboundary hazards that we are facing. By the same token, um, expectations of reasonableness in behavior and ex uh, expectations of, of um, that, that you will act reasonably or, or that you need to that it needs to be proven that you have acted unreasonably before you can be held accountable for the damage that you cause is that a workable expectation uh, when the damage is environmental damage and is very often only discovered years and years after um, after the damage has been perpetrated 
Um, also, new developments in environmental law have led to renew renewed investigations about the post-war iconology of law as an engine for change. Uh, our contemporary societies very often put a lot of, um, put a lot of faith in law being able to foster change. Um, it's, very, it's become a very typical expectation, for example, uh, if a country negotiates a loan with the IMF or with the World Bank, that one of the conditions is, but you have to introduce particular laws. So there's a clear expectation that law can produce change in society. Now, we have, for example, uh, in, in the United Kingdom, where um, I work, um, we have a vast range of environmental legislation, and yet we have deteriorating environments. The state of the environment is uh, uh, worrisome. Um, and so this challenges this idea that we have, that we promote, that uh, just by changing the laws you can actually change society. So that's a first point I wanted to address. I think a first contribution that environmental law makes to the discipline more generally and also to the profession more generally is that it challenges accept, uh, accepted and entrenched notions and invites us, urges us to reconsider these notions. A second way in which environmental law and legal scholarship contributes to the field generally is in that it urges us also to rethink the public-private divide. As environmental law forms the vanguard in a discussion that is pervading many areas of law, from investment law to family law, namely the reconceptualization of the public-private divide. Um, increasingly, for example, in investment treaties, there are provisions that uh, ensure that investors can sue governments for adopting regulations if these regulations change the climate of investment. Now, is that a contractual arrangement or a, a public law arrangement? The boundaries between public law and private law in that field seem to be blurring. And as environmental lawyers, we have a lot of experience working with these blurred boundaries. Environmental law has, since its early development in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, always consisted of partly private law and partly public law. And we also have a rich body of experience in environmental law with how unsatisfying and disruptive this divide can sometimes be. For example, uh, when it comes to uh, holding parties accountable for environmental damage, the bifurcation between either having to sue the state and having to go through a particular set of, um, of, legal, rem of uh, legal access provisions and remedies in one direction, or having to sue private uh, parties and, uh, through another set of channels, that division can be very disruptive uh, and can uh, hinder attempts to get uh, due compensation for environmental damage. Um, so we are, as environmental lawyers, very familiar with the downsides of this traditional public-private law divide. And at the same time, we've learned to deal with regimes that fit neither mold, that seem to be a combination of public law and private law. Uh, a good example here would be uh, the Nagoya Protocol to the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which establishes a regime that is partly a public law regime in that uh, uh, states have to be um, informed if there is going to be bioprospecting taking place uh, in their state. But it's also, it has a lot of contractual structures because it enables for, um, the, uh, for private parties to negotiate fair terms for access to biological resources and for the sharing of benefits from, uh, that flows from research that is then later being done with those researchers. So it's a kind of, they are, these are almost hybrid public-private um, structures that in environmental law we have by now a degree of familiarity with and it's, it's an experience that is a very useful source to share with other legal disciplines as they too see the boundaries between public and private law um, becoming blurry. 
So that's two contributions I think we already make. A third contribution is that environmental lawyers and environmental legal academics particularly are very apt at dealing with legal plurality. And what I mean by that is very simply that pretty much any kind of problem that we are confronted with in our field is governed by not one but by several legal regimes at several levels of governance. It's, you know, it's hard to think these days of an environmental problem uh, that doesn't involve at least some degree or that has some connection to international law as well as regional law as well as domestic law. And again, this is, this is a, in, in this era of globalization, and of globalization of trade and of enhanced mobility of people. This is this plurality of legal regimes pertaining to a particular problem, um, which requires lawyers to be able to negotiate different legal documents at different, from different jurisdictions in order to come to terms with a problem. This is a characteristic that is becoming more and more pervasive, not just in environmental law, but in many fields beyond it. Again, I think it's a contribution that environmental legal academics and environmental legal practice makes to the field generally that we have established an early expertise, an early aptitude in this negotiating of plural sources of authority. Or, you know, differently put, if um, you seek good understanding of how completing, competing claims to authority are settled between, for instance, the WTO and the European Convention on Human Rights, you could do far worse than to consult an environmental lawyer. So that's, I think, a third contribution uh, that, uh, that we make. So uh, beyond um, uh, challenging classical conceptions in law, beyond um, overcoming the public-private divide, there's also we um, have a good practice in coping with legal plurality. A fourth point is that um, environmental legal scholarship has really been one of the pioneering fields to think about uh, the role, the importance, and also the risks related to the increased reliance on soft law. There's traditionally always been a lot of soft law, you know, kind of guidance uh, that is added to legal text that formally is not binding, but that very often in practice has a quasi-similar status to the legal prov uh, provisions to which it is attached. Um, there's an increasing reliance on these kind of soft law mechanisms in lawmaking. And for reasons that would take me too long to explain now in detail, uh, but one of them being the fact that soft law is particularly prominent in lawmaking beyond the state, and in environmental law, there's a lot of lawmaking beyond the state. Um, in, environmental law has had to deal with soft law and ha has had to ask serious questions about, well, if you have a norm that is officially a voluntary norm, a non-binding norm, but that is received by the community as if it were binding, and that, practically speaking, is very difficult for the community to avoid, then how do you deal with this kind of norm? What kind of an interpretive value, for example, what kind of a directive value does such a norm have in regulatory decision making? What kind of special considerations should the judiciary give to uh, a soft law norm compared to any other kind of claim or statement or uh, piece of evidence? So, the legal thinking about soft law and the role and challenges of soft law has been, I think, advanced a lot in the field of environmental legal scholarship, and it is a contribution to legal scholarship and to the profession more generally. And then finally, and maybe most significantly, um, environmental law has also fueled the debate 
about regulatory, cho about regulatory choice. It's one way to say that, for example, we need regulation in order to enhance the quality of education, for example. But there are many different strategies that one can deploy in order to try and achieve this goal. And environmental, um, environmental law has been the most fantastic laboratory for regulatory experiment, for experimentation with regulatory instrument choice, for experimentation with different types of regulatory strategies. Um, and every major author in the field of regulatory studies, um, from uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, US Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, uh, to some of my own uh, colleagues at the LSE, uh, Julia Black and Robert Baldwin, have spent a considerable amount of their efforts examining developments in environmental regulation precisely because it is a field that is so rich in experience with regulatory alternatives. Um, only yesterday in the workshop that uh, it is my privilege to conduct here at DKU uh, University, uh, the students and I were talking about um, different regulatory strategies that one can deploy in order to pursue uh, CO2 emissions reductions. Um, equally, environmental regulation is an invaluable training ground for students of risk regulation, self-regulation, responsive regulation, smart regulation, deregulation, re-regulation, and everything in between. So, environmental regulation is the field where regulation has been most heavily scrutinized. And arguably because of that, it's the field where the most creative thinking has gone on. Um, and so it's often locked in battles to justify its existence. But as a result, I think it's become a really powerful engine for reinvention and a game changer in regulatory studies. And I think that's a fifth important contribution that we make. So when it comes to what do environmental legal academics contribute to the field of academics generally and to the profession generally, I think we can say that we do contribute. We contribute um, by challenging conventional wisdoms, rethinking the public-private divide, coping with legal plurality, exploring and challenging the hard law, soft law divide, and expanding regulatory choices. Undoubtedly, we also contribute in myriad other ways that I am uh, overlooking at the moment. I think it, as an environmental lawyer, it's a contribution to be proud of. And judging by the enthusiasm uh, and the keenness of the students that I have taught uh, earlier this week, I think it's a contribution that is bound to get only stronger in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ewart. Thank you very much for your informative uh, presentation, especially drawing significant attention towards the environmental law. At a time the, all the world leaders are talking about the global warming and environmental hazards, I think that uh, Professor drew the attention of the legal profession of our duty as to how that we should act in relation to the protection of the environment. For all the survival of not only of human beings, all beings, that environment has to be uh, protected. At the same time, it is significant to note in her presentation that uh, she categorically drew the attention of all these budding lawyers who are expected to be full-fledged lawyers in few years' time, that your individual duty to your litigant, your client, as well as to your society at large. I think the lawyers are not merely to serve the litigants who pay for their work. They are the protectors and they have to protect the, they have to, uh, protect the rights and liberty of the people living in a country. 